singer, songwriter, countless roles on film, television, and radio. You train. World famous theme song. Legions of screaming Bobby Soxes and fans. 21 gold records. You knew who Frankie Lane was the moment he came on. I loved him. He was just so dramatic and, and so powerful. When you listen, you say, ah, that's Frankie Lane. Frankie Lane, an American dreamer. During this look at the life of the legendary Frankie Lane, we will see Frankie's childhood, his years of struggle through the Great Depression and two world wars, his final break, his rise to stardom, his fall at the hands of rock and roll, and the singer's climb to the land of legends. Through it all, we will see the incredible diligence, the determination, the stamina, and the talent that was born to two Sicilian immigrants on the eve of Jazz Age Chicago. I'm gonna live till I die. I'm gonna laugh instead of cry. I'm gonna take the town and turn it upside down. I'm gonna live till I die. Just gonna stay what a guy. I'm gonna play for the sky. Ain't gonna miss a thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna live, live till I die. I was dancing with someone, but I was looking at you. In 1913, the prohibitionists were gaining momentum. Woodrow Wilson was president of the United States, and we were only four years from the First World War, when Francesco Paolo Lavecchio, one day to be known the world over as the great singer Frankie Lane, was born to John and Anna Lavecchio. In my place, baby. But the marriage of Frankie's parents almost never happened. Anna's father had already promised her to another man. John left town taking a job with the Pennsylvania Railroad, Anna's little heart was broken, almost broken in two. So she began a diligent campaign to change her father's mind. Slowly, surely, she succeeded. And in 1910, John and Anna were finally married. Three years later, the legend of song was born. And we know one thing for sure. This little boy inherited the same stubborn diligence that his mother had shown when she stood up to her strict father and insisted on marrying the man of her own choosing. The stubborn diligence of an American immigrant. Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, say, Kamada, Ke. Di quella donna irradiante. Hi, I'm your host Lou Rawls, and I'm here to take you on a journey through the life and legend of Mr. Frankie Lane. You know, after struggling for years and facing all kinds of adversities, Frankie Lane was signed to Mercury Records in 1946. The very next year, his recording of That's My Desire went gold and shot the singer into stardom. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. The song that started the whole thing back in 1947. To spend one night My early uh, romantic life was uh, definitely driven by uh, Frankie Lane's uh, records. And uh, if you could uh, sit and hum, that's my desire to some gal, uh, sometimes it uh, had interesting results. <laughs> to meet where gypsies play <laughs> down in some dim cafe <laughs> and dance to pray you take that's my desire. Sip a little glass of wine And I'll gaze into your eyes divine I'll feel the touch of your lips 
pressing on my to hear you whisper low just when it's time to go Jerry I love you so that's my desire to me where gypsies play <laughs> down in the gym get <laughs> in day to you break of day that's my desire <laughs> we'll sip a little glass of wine I'll get a gay hint you right about I'll feel the touch of your lips <laughs> dressing on mind to 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 hear you Wish blue. Yes. When in time you go. Jerry, I love you so. Take it. You're my desire. Things, but why pick on me, Dad? It's good for you. In the late 40s and throughout the 50s, Frankie Lane was one of the most popular male voices in the country. During his career, he recorded 21 gold records. He enjoyed huge crowds of screaming Bobby Soxes and fans, starred in seven feature films, sang the title track for many popular westerns, hosted his own television variety show, appeared in countless television and radio shows, and wrote beloved standards with such greats as Duke Ellington, Hoagie Carmichael, and Carl Fisher. But perhaps the singer was best known for his rendition of one of the most popular television theme songs of all time, and that song, Rawhide. Keep rolling, 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 oh, the streams are swollen, If you ask Frankie, he'll tell you that his biggest hit was his gold record, I Believe. Now this song was seen by many as a statement of faith, but perhaps you could also see it as an inspirational song. If you believe in yourselves as Frankie believed in himself, if you work hard as Frankie worked hard, then you too can achieve success and fulfill your American dream. I believe. For every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. I believe that somewhere in the darkest night, a candle glows. I was in the fourth grade, and one day the Monsignor came by and said, we need some choir boys. You, 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 you. That's how I got picked. And I was in the choir for five years, and the only thing I knew about singing at that point was hymns. As President Hoover was moving the country out of the Depression with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, Frankie Lane was working just as hard for himself and for his family. For 145 days, Frankie swayed back and forth with his partner to end up in the Guinness Book of World Records. Here we can see the first signs of that determination that stubborn diligence he inherited from his Sicilian immigrant parents. Well, that was 1932 when we established a record on Young's Million Dollar Pier in uh, Atlantic City. When the promoters felt that the marathon had gone long enough, and we were down to two couples, and I was the only entertainer of the four people that were left, they felt it was time to close it down. So they picked it a, a weekend, and they picked a Saturday night, of course, 
And it was just packed. There must have been about 12,000 people there. They put us on what they called a final grind. And that meant no food, no drink, no bathroom visit, no nothing. You had to stay locked in position and keep moving. And whoever stopped for 10 seconds, for whatever reason, was out. Who broke contact, was out. Uh, who spoke, was out. Uh, and finally, um, I was 19, he was 38 at the time. Uh, age took its toll at 38, can you imagine that? He actually, uh, I'm not kidding about it, he actually wet his pants and that disqualified him. So that's how we won. <laughs> After winning first place three times as a dancer, he sprained his ankle. And seeing the marathon dancing fad give way to the new roller derby craze, Frankie said he'd had enough. In 1935, he quit the exhausting life of the marathon circuit to become a singer. Jezebel, Jezebel, Jezebel. As President Roosevelt started the second stage of the New Deal, so too Frankie found himself starting something new. But little did he know that there were many exhausting years still to come. Eddie Gilmartin, who took me to the first marathon in Baltimore, was now managing the Chicago Trianon Ballroom on the south side. And the orchestra that was there at the time was Ted Weems. And the singer was Perry Como, who had Chicago like that. He was really hot. So, uh, there was a rumor going around that Perry was going to leave to go with Paul Whiteman, who was interested in him. So I went down to see Eddie Gilmartin. I said, Eddie, do you think if Perry really leaves, I could get an audition with Ted Weems? Can you fix it for me? So he did. So it was a Tuesday night, and I went down. It was in December of 37. And I auditioned for Ted Weems, and I sang Never in a Million Years, which is a great song. And it looked like I was going to get the job. And at the last minute, for some reason, Perry changed his mind. He decided to stay with Ted Weems. So I met him after the rehearsal. They were rehearsing on Tuesday night. And he said, I'm sorry, man. He said, but I've decided to stay. He says, would you take a job in Cleveland? And I said, hell yes. <laughs> you know, I'd go anywhere. Slowly, an idea was taking form in my head to take a shot at New York, and this became a very uh, turbulent time for me. I went to New York. I stayed there for about eight weeks, and uh, I began doing the usual things that uh, I was advised to do by the people who were trying to do the same thing around 52nd Street, where all the action seemed to be. At the time, the toast of this historic swing street was clarinetist Joe Masala, who was playing at the Hickory House. And I found out that he was a kid that lived two blocks away from me in Chicago, who was now a big musical star. He had a marvelous band. Uh, he was on clarinet. His brother Marty played trumpet. Artie Shapiro was on bass, who later played on some of the recordings I made in L.A. Joe Bushkin was on piano. Buddy Rich was on drums, and there was a guitar player named Ray Biondi. And we became pretty close and got me up to sing. And uh, it was a Sunday afternoon jam session thing. And apparently, I broke it up. So I began hanging around the Hickory House. And uh, one night, Joe got uh, close to me and he said, uh, why don't you get a tux and come in? So I did. The period that I spent at uh, the Hickory House was about eight weeks. I sat in the chair one night, every night rather, beside, near the bandstand. He never, never, never in eight weeks called me up to sing at night during the sessions. I could sing on Sunday afternoons during the jam session, but he never called me at night. So finally one night I walked out and he saw me leave. And I had tears in my eyes and I was crying going down the street. 
And he ran after me. He got off the bandstand and ran after me and dragged me back. He says, I promise I'll put you on tomorrow night. He didn't. <laughs> Frankie did get a few jobs in New York, but his ship had definitely not come in. So just make it one for my baby and one more for the long. The starving singer went from club to club, but nothing happened. He snuck into hotels and slept on the floor. He flopped on the YMCA's and eventually on a wooden bench in Central Park. You know what? That's really tough. That second time in New York was the worst, I think, as far as uh, what happened to me. <laughs> Eight for penny baby roots for dinner one night. Oh, Jesus. Just cause I'm always handy, always feeling fine and dandy. That is why they call me shine. Finally, young Francesco Paolo Levecchio landed an audition at radio station WINS. He sang the song Shine. He sang the song Marie. And then he finished it off with Rosetta. And a great big, tall, handsome football player kind of a guy came running out of the booth and says, hey, what's your name? I said, Frank Lavecchio. He says, what? I said, Frank Lavecchio. He says, we're going to have to do something about that. So I sensed the job, you know. I said, fine. So he said, uh, how about Frankie Lang? I said, no. In my naivete, I figured there was a guy named Eddie Lang playing guitar with Bing Crosby. Might be some confusion. <laughs> Stupid, you know. So he says, how about Frankie Lane? I says, oh, that's fine. So he says, okay, uh, you'll be on three times a week with uh, the orchestra. And um, he had forgotten that there was a girl on the station by the name of Frances Lane. And in my, again, my naivete, I figured, well, there might be some confusion with the fan mail. <laughs> I'm thinking fan mail. I haven't even started yet. So I stuck an eye in the middle. And that's how it became what it is. Coombs only paid Frankie $5 a week to sing on his station. That was barely enough to pay for a boarding house across the street. Lucky for Frankie, he met Sal Pepe, who heard Frankie sing on WINS, and just so happened to own a restaurant called Cosmos. The day that I auditioned for WINS and got the job, I had a quarter left. And I don't remember where I got that quarter. But on the way back, I was getting hungry and I hadn't had breakfast. I stopped at a, an Italian restaurant on 49th Street called Cosmos. So I walked in and, the, and it was busy, it was lunchtime, and uh, I stopped at the only stool at the counter, which was right by the cash register. And this guy was behind the, the counter at the cash register. And I guess just to make conversation, he said, how you doing? I said, well, he always said, great, you know. <laughs> I said, what are you gonna have? And I said, uh, I like spaghetti. I'll have the spaghetti and meatballs. It was the cheapest thing on the menu, and it was a quarter. So that's why I ordered it. He saw the way I wolfed it down. And uh, I guess when I finished, he says, uh, how you doing? I says, that was my last quarter. He says, well, what's your name? I said, Frankie Lane. I gave him the new name. He says, he says did you just sing on a radio station? I said, yeah. He says, W-I-N-S? I says, yeah. He says, hey, you're great. You're gonna make it. You come in here and eat any time you want. Don't worry about the check. You'll pay me back someday. I ate there for three months, and I always ordered spaghetti and meatballs. I didn't have guts enough to order anything else more expensive. And Pepe became a very, very dear friend, and I, I paid him back years later. It was 1945, and World War II was about to end. My buddy. Frankie was out of a job. Perhaps this was just the push he needed. One night, I went into Billy Berg's, which was a jazz joint in Hollywood. I sang Rock and Share, and Hoagie Carmichael was in the house, the guy who wrote the song. So when I finished the song, he saw this guy come running up to the stage. He says, what's your name? And I told him, he says, where are you working? I says, I'm not. He says, come with me. And I says, where are you going? He says, I want you to meet Billy Berg. And I knew Billy Berg better than I knew him. So he says, hey, Billy, this kid sings great. Why don't you put him to work? Billy says, what for? He comes in and sings every night for nothing, which was true. 
And that's where it all started at Billy Berg's. Billy Berg hired Frankie as an intermission entertainer for $75 a week. Soon Billy got tired of hosting the nightly broadcast, so he handed it over to Frankie. Success for Frankie was now just around the corner. And I was working at Billy Berg's, I think maybe two months before Slim left, another group came in, Edgar Hayes and his Stardusters, and uh, I asked him if he remembered that song and why I thought of the song that night, I will never know. To this day, I don't know. I asked him if he remembered a song called That's My Desire, and he says, oh yeah, man, great song for you. He says, after we finish dinner, let's go to the piano and I'll find your key, and we'll do it tonight as a new song, because all I did was standards, you know. So that night, that's what happened. I introduced it as a new song, which I meant new for me. Instead, everybody thought I was gonna do a new song because it was an old tune from 1931 and I assumed everybody knew about it. Fortunately, it was old enough so that not many people knew about it and everybody thought it was a new song. That night changed my life. The boss's wife, Billy Berg's wife, was crazy about the song. She came running up, she said, Frank, do it again. That night I did it five times and within one month, I was headlining. Now, can you believe that? The people from Mercury Records had recorded the guy who was, uh, uh, who had an orchestra there, Milton the Lug and the Swing Wing, and I did a song with them called I May Be Wrong But I Think You're Wonderful, which Al Jarvis began to play. Now here I am working at Billy Berg's, and he's playing a record that I recorded with the band that's playing there. So the people from Mercury came down to hear him and heard me. They offered me a contract, and on that next recording date that we went in, that's when I did Desire. Desire came out December 15th, 1946. You spend one night with you. I remember when I first met him, I said, when did you know that's my desire would be a hit? And he said, well, they suspected it because every time he would do it as part of his nightclub act, it would always get a tremendous reception. That's my desire. To this day, That's My Desire is Frankie's second biggest hit. Just behind the number one, I Believe, and just before number three, Jezebel. As it began to rise on the charts, an interesting thing happened. And all of a sudden, desire is, and everybody thinks I'm black. And I had no pictures out. I was like the new black singer at, at Billy Berg's. People in L.A. knew the difference, but people all the rest of the country didn't know. Well, that caused quite a bit of confusion for a while. When you first heard That's My Desire, did you think that Frankie was black? I didn't think he was white. I yeah, I know. <laughs> at that time, Billboard used to have what they used to call the Harlem charts. Mm -hmm. In Los Angeles, Detroit, San Francisco, Harvey. Chicago, mm -hmm. about 10 cities. Each had an individual Harlem chart. Rhythm and blues, they'd call mm -hmm. it too. Today it's yeah. called rhythm and blues. Mm -hmm. And slowly, desire, now I had no clothes. I had uh, uh, no photographs. I was still climbing out of the hole. Yeah. So nobody knew what I looked I was, like. I, I really want to get a chance to do uh, the tune that I did when uh, I won my first prize. And uh, the tune that, you know, I was doing, I'd like to really do a little bit of it. Do it. To spend <laughs> one night. I just do it. I just do it. I signed with uh, a guy named Sam Lutz, and he had a partner named Dick Gaby in New York. And Sam went out on the road with "That's My Desire" to hype it, and uh, he stopped in Pittsburgh, and he had this one stop, small one stop where he carried all these offbeat labels and these new labels. And Sam was in there one day when this big uh, operator of about 700 jukeboxes walked in who was Afro-American. And uh, they started yakking at the counter. Sam says, what are you buying these days? The guy said, oh, that new guy on the West Coast, Frankie Lane, that got, that's my desire. He's number one on all the Harlem charts across the country. So Sam, to this day, he didn't know whether he made a mistake. He says, he's white. The guy says, no. He says, yeah, he's white. No. The next day I was off all the Harlem charts throughout the country. The record also became a huge hit on the Armed Forces radio network in Europe. 
It was during this time that the British, who became devoted and loyal fans, first heard of Frankie Lane. It was incredible with, uh, with Frankie Lane, and that's why we're here, and I want to thank you, Frankie, for many teenage experiences. Uh, and it was a lot in, to do with fairgrounds in England and uh, the teenage madness as you go through, but Frankie was always blasting out. Uh, you know, Jezebel was, he was so powerful. That's why I loved him. He was just so dramatic and, and so powerful. The first time I heard Frankie Lane was in April 1948. My mother was a big fan and she'd got a copy of That's My Desire on the English Brunswick label. And one day she happened to turn the record over and I heard By the River St. Marie and it blew my mind. <laughs> Jezebel started us off with Frankie Lane, the wife and myself, when we were teenagers. And uh, we've been admirers of his music ever since. Oh, as a child, when he was popular at that time. My sister and I, were uh, quite good fans and we used to buy recordings at that time with our pocket money. Frankie has a great following in, in uh, England and I think that the English fans aren't as fickle as your uh, stateside fans because they are, um, they don't go with the tide in other words. If they are a fan of yours, they are fans for life. And that was the thing that I uh, noticed most about Frankie's fans because they have been with him all these years and they're still going to be with him. You know, they'll always be Frankie Lane fans and the women will always bake him cookies and all kinds of things and bring to him. Well, I'm 32 now, but, um, but I've loved him all my life. I, I, guess, I guess my parents um, brought me up on his music, but I was always the real fan and uh, it was always my dream to meet him. And my dream came true in 1988. But he's affected my life so enormously. Um, and I'm speechless, really. I get very shaky when I hear his music, and um, yeah, he's made my life. Things were really going well for Frankie, so he signed with Hollywood manager Sam Lutz. Unfortunately, when Frankie hired Lutz to manage him, he found himself fired from Billy Berg's. That was after Lutz demanded a $25 a week raise for the singer. Luckily, though, Lutz got Frankie a job down the street at the Morocco, where he earned $150. You gotta know that was a lot of money. Soon Carl Fisher took over the conducting and arranging. Now Frankie's life was in order. He had a hit record on his way to becoming gold. He had a partner, he had a manager, and boy, he was making good money. All was well, except for one little teeny weeny problem. Frankie Lane was losing his hair. After That's My Desire became a hit, Mercury Records executives flew Frankie to Chicago to be featured at the National American Music Convention. Now Frankie's hair was a little thin on the top, you know, and his manager decided he needed a full head of hair to appeal to the younger record-buying public. Well, I had never worn this thing. The agency who booked me on the job said, look, you're getting along in years. You're 33, 34. <laughs> and we know the kids are buying the record. So we want you to look the part. So they convinced me, oh, I hated it. They convinced me to go to Max Factors and get a hairpiece. And the guys didn't know what my hair was like before. It was kind of curly. So they made me a very straight kind of a hairpiece. And in those days, we used to use the lace front, which you had to apply spirit gum on your forehead first and then press it down. And it was quite undetectable for beginning, and in pictures it worked great, but in person I wasn't sure. And I didn't know too well about how to do it. So I get to the hotel, it was from my first plane ride, by the way, 1947, from L.A. to Chicago. And I carried this thing in a box. <laughs> I didn't want to put it on the plane, in the plane. <laughs> so I check in the hotel, and it comes time, the very first thing we have to do is a promotion appearance with Dave Garraway. Remember Dave Garraway? He was on NBC late at night. So we had dinner, my manager, Sam Lutz, and Jimmy Hitler, who was the head A&R guy, that means uh, artist and repertoire, he, record producer from Mercury Records, were waiting for me downstairs. And I went upstairs to put this thing on. And I fiddled with it for like over an hour and a half before I got it looking right. I thought. 
So I go downstairs, I go out the side entrance of the hotel in Chicago, and <laughs> The wind takes it down the street. And I got so mad. I said, you want me to wear that freaking thing? You go find it. And I didn't say freaky. So Jimmy found it wedged under the tire of a car. Parked at the curb. Luckily it was on the outside, not in the gutter. And he picked it up and he brought it back. Holding the back, back strands <laughs> like a dead something or other. And I had nothing to put it in. The box was upstairs. So Sam had a newspaper. So they folded it up and put it inside the newspaper. And Sam carried it and they couldn't help laughing. I was mad. So now we get to the studio, which was on the 19th floor of the NBC building in Chicago. And I head right for the restroom. Because I know I got a lot of spirit gum in my forehead. So I get a paper towel, and I wet it thoroughly, and I rub and rub and rub and rub and rub, and I got rid of the spirit gum, but I left a big red line. <laughs> so now I get in the studio with Dave Garraway, and he does the whole show, 45 minutes, never look me in the eye. All he could see was this red line, and I thought, wondering what the hell had I done. I wasn't sure it was going to last. Uh, it reminded me of times previous where I thought I was on the way and then something would happen. In fact, I figured if I couldn't make it as a, as a singer, maybe I could make it as a songwriter. I had written a song called It Only Happens Once, and when I went to the coast, I had heard about a new guy that Al Jarvis had just made famous, a guy by the name of Nat Cole, and he was working at a little place called the 331 Club, so I went to see him one night on my night off, and I waited till he was through with the set, and as he walked off the stand, I walked up, went up to him, and I said, uh, Mr. Cole, my name is Frankie Lane, and I've written a song that I think would be good for you. So he took a look at it, and he began singing it. I said, yeah. And he says, hey, it's a good song, man. I'll record it. So I figured, hey, I'm underway as a songwriter. Forget singing. In 1943, when my career was just beginning to get off the ground, a young unknown songwriter came to me with a song he thought would fit my style. It was a good song, too. I liked it well enough to record it. It was called, It Only Happens Once, and it went something like this. It only happens once. I'll never feel that thrill again. It only happens once. Why couldn't I have known it then? Pretty song, huh? Well, the composer of that song, who was so widely unknown 14 years ago, is our guest tonight. And here he is, my good friend, Frankie Lane. Yeah, man. Frankie, how you doing, Daddy? Good luck, old boy. You know, Frank, you know, your, your song sounds every bit as good today as it did when you first played it for me. Oh? Well, thank you, Matt. And you sang it every bit as well today as when you first sang it for me. You know, Frankie, I think you sing as well today as you ever did. Well, Matt, uh, I think you play the piano as well today as you ever did. It's your turn. <laughs> Frankie, I think we better quit while we're both ahead, huh? I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> I know they really liked each other, and Matt was not a person who talked a lot, even to me. You know, he just wasn't... He, he would with, with musicians and at night, late, you know, all that, but he wasn't a person who just talked about his friends a lot. But he always talked about Frank to me. He, would, he told me about him, and that's why after Nat died, when I was living close to him for a while, I wanted to go see him, and I did. You know, I always felt the sort of, I'm sorry, through the years I didn't get to see him because I felt a warm relationship with him. I became good friends with Nat, and, um closer and closer through the years, and then I met Carl Fisher. And Carl and I started writing together, and the first song that we wrote was We'll Be Together Again, which today, although we couldn't get it started at that time, uh, it's become a great jazz standard. There's over 100 records on it now by different people. No tears, no fears. Remember there's always tomorrow. So what if we have to part? 
we'll be together again someday some way we all have a lifetime before us for party is not goodbye We had a tough time breaking through that. All the publishers that we took it to said, hey, it's 15 years ahead of its time. Nobody said 17. Nobody said 20. Nobody said 10. Everybody always said 15. We couldn't figure it out. We finally got through to the Pied Pipers. And they were on Capitol, along with, Jim, with uh, Johnny Mercer's label. And they recorded it first. Then the publisher at that time was a friend of Les Brown's. He took it to Les, and Les liked it. And at that time, he had a marvelous singer with him named Doris Day. So we got a great vocal from Doris Day on this We'll Be Together Again with Les Brown. And all of a sudden, I got a recording contract, and uh, I had uh, a Desire Was a Hit, and then we had um, Sunday Kind of Love, then we had Mamzelle, then we had Two Loves of I, and then we had another big one called Shine. Shine, not with your shoes, you say now. Shine it twice up, make it look like new. Why don't you shine your face up, hey? Why don't you wear a little smaller too? Shine, 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 the days and those days. Everything's gonna turn out right fine, mighty fine. Oh, sweet, shine up to ya. Everybody's gonna howdy to ya. We'll make that whole To the recording strike by all the musicians against against the record companies, the union and all the guys, you know. So I was lucky that I caught Shine when I did in December of 1948, which was exactly one year from the day that Desire had come out. So I figured maybe it's a sign of some kind. Maybe this might last. In the meantime, I've begun to write with Carl, and we were writing other things and recording other things. And uh, nothing that we wrote seemed to make any difference after we'll be together again. It wound up on the back of Shine, which was a million seller, so a lot of people heard it. Now, off of that record, we get a Stan Kenton record, we get a Billie Holiday record, and after that, after Billie Holiday recorded it, everybody seemed to jump on it. 1947 brought the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, and Frankie's first album with Mercury Records. With the impending musician strike, Frankie had to rush recording and pick standards that would not need much rehearsal time. Mm -hmm. Grab your coat, get your hat, leave your worries on the doorstep. Just direct your feet over to the sunny side of the street. I got ten zillion dollars and nothing to do. I own Central Park in California, too. Chicago in December of 1947, Frankie knew he had really arrived when he was booked at the New York Paramount Theater. Now, he had promised himself he would never go back to New York after failing there twice. That was unless he could go back on a white horse. Now, he couldn't forget those nights on a park bench in Central Park or those long days without food. During his run at the Paramount, Frankie treated himself to a very special night out. He put on a camel hair coat and a custom-made suit. He found that old bench that was once his bed, and he sat down on it, smiled, and leisurely ate a much nicer candy bar than the penny ones he had eaten before. In one pocket, he had a loaded wallet. In the other, a key to one of the nicest hotel suites in New York. Then he hailed a cab and went to Times Square. Now there, in big, beautiful lights, his name stood out against the night sky. Was he a happy man? You betcha. Yeah, buddy. One of the bookings I had was 
July of 1948 at the Coconut Grove in Los Angeles. And uh, I didn't know any of this was happening. Some gal uh, who was celebrating her 28th birthday, when she was asked what she wanted to do for her birthday, she says, I want to go down to hear that black singer at Coconut Grove sing That's My Desire. And uh, after the show, some guy came to my dressing room, my room, knocked on the door and said, there's a lady out there who wants to say hello. So he took me out to meet her. He says, Frankie Lane, this is Nan Gray, Nan Gray. And he said, Boom. That was it. Frankie's touring took him out of town. But about a year later, he ran into actress Nan Gray in the owner's box at the Golden Gate Park racetrack. They dated from then on and were married in a quiet ceremony on June 15, 1950. A marriage that lasted 44 years. The young actress who had caught Frankie's eye in the 1936 movie Three Smart Girls with Deanna Durbin was now his beloved wife. Something else happened in April of 1949. Mercury Records brought in Mitch Miller, a classically trained oboist, to be Frankie's new A&R man. And all of a sudden we get Mitch Miller, who comes from the classical field. So I don't know how this is going to turn out. All of a sudden, here we go again. I finally got started. I got a recording career, and boom, a new A&R man. Well, the very first song he brings me is Lucky Old Son. Show me that river, take me across, wash all my troubles away, like that lucky old son. Nothing to do but roll around. All day. And of course, it was an entirely different type of song for me. I had been singing nothing but jazz up until that point. And now all of a sudden comes like a, like a, almost like an old man river, you know. And uh, when that broke through, it put me into a whole different category, I guess. And people who never had bothered to listen to my stuff before, uh, the jazz things, all of a sudden, then he brings me Mule Train. <laughs> I was scared to death. I said, Mitch, I'll lose every jazz fan I ever had. He says, maybe, but you'll also pick up a lot of people who haven't listened to you before. Well, we were both right. Mule Train. Leary coming over hill and plain. Seems as how they never stop. Liberty clap, liberty clap, liberty, 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 clapping along. There's a plug of joy to back you for a rancher in Corona. A guitar for a cowboy way out in Arizona. A test of calico for a pretty Navajo. Get along, mule head. Ah! Oh, wait. What happened with this thing? It just worked. That's better. Go. <laughs> the first record, uh, Frankie was up in, uh, I think it was in Minneapolis, and he was going to come to the to Detroit, and I heard a record, a mule train. Early Sunday morning at the Universal Studios, we did it with four musicians, and, uh, and that was the first two million seller in in history of the record business. And then he brought me Wild Goose, Cry the Wild Goose. So that was like four million sellers in a row. And I said, hey, from now on, you pick them. My heart knows what the wild goose knows. I'll just go home where the wild goose goes. Wild goose, which is best? A wandering food or a heart that He was my kind of guy. He, you know, he uh, he was very dramatic in his singing, and and you must remember, in those days there were no videos, so you had to depend 
on the image that the record made in the listener's ears. I was still looking for material. So I found a song called, which wasn't hard to find. Everybody and his brother had done it. Jealousy. Jealousy, night and day you torture me. I sometimes wonder if the spell that I'm under can only be a melody. In the meantime, he finds High Noon. I do not know what fate awaits me. You made that promise as a bride. Do not forsake me, oh my God. Although you're grieving, don't think of leaving. Just before I left Mercury, I had found a song called Jezebel. And I had a hunch when Mitch left Mercury and went to Columbia that he said to me, he says, if you ever decide not to renew with Mercury, there'll be a place for you at Columbia. So I stashed Jezebel in a drawer in the desk and I never told anybody about it. A guy by the name of Wayne Shanklin brought it to me. And uh, the kid who demonstrated it was a fine singer and I said, you know, you don't need me for this. He's great. He says, yeah, but nobody knows him. He's just getting started. He just got out of the Marines or something. Tony Bennett. Mitch uh, had a song called Rose, Rose, I Love You, which he wanted me to record when I made the deal at Columbia and switched from Mercury to Columbia. I said, Mitch, I got a song that's better than this, than Rose, Rose, I Love You. He says, what is it? So I played Jezebel for him. He says, yeah, it's, it is good. So we put him back to back. Jezebel and Rose Rose became 1-3. Well, the only other time that had happened to me before that was Lucky Old Son and Mule Train. And then they reversed. Mule Train was number one and Lucky Old Son was second. So this was the second time it was happening to me that two songs on the same record were one and two and two and one. So Mitch was really looking out for me. And I believe me when I say you can't do it by yourself. People help you. He was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me as far as help is concerned. His songs were topping the charts and gracing the silver screen in films like Make Believe Ballroom, When You're Smiling, Sunny Side of the Street, and Rainbow Around My Shoulder. He was a featured guest on countless radio shows and television shows like The Bob Hope Show. My name is Shepard Carter. I am a young medical student. Do I want to sacrifice my life to the hardships of medicine? Or do I want something softer? My name is Beverly Stanton. I'm a softie. I love Chef. But do I want to share a life of hardship as a struggling doctor's wife? Or do I want to sacrifice love for luxury and marry some wealthy schmo? <laughs> My name is Herman Fergal. Need I say more? <laughs> Darling! Lover! Why did you ask me to meet you here in his apartment? Well, you know I couldn't live without you. That's why I'm going to marry Herman Fergal. Wait a minute. If you love me, why marry him? Well, don't you see, Chef? Herman is fabulously wealthy. With his money, I can put you through medical school. But I love you, Beverly, and I won't give you up. You don't have to give me up. I'll just tell him you're my cousin. Oh, so that's what you want. You expect me to give up my identity, my work, my hope, my ambition, everything I've ever lived for. And for what? For this. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, hey. Wow. Well, you got a pretty good argument there. <laughs> Oh, there you are, honey. Oh, I'm sorry I'm late, but I had an accident in the shower. I slipped on a cake of money. <laughs> what, you slipped money? Mamma mia. Oh, I see. Who's this? Oh, oh, this is my cousin Shepard. After 15 years, I ran into him today. Oh, must have been a nasty bump. His lip is still bleeding. <laughs> uh, Herman, 
Herman, darling. Yes. Oh, wasn't there something you wanted to ask me? Yes, baby, but it's in private. I just don't oh, like to... Oh, uh... don't mind, Chef. He's just like one of the family. Yeah? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, darling, yeah. I, I must tell you, I have a problem. You see, I'm a bachelor. I have no relatives. There's nothing but just me and my money. Oh, I could be such a friend of both of you. <laughs> no, you don't understand. You see, I just took out an insurance policy for $5 million. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> got a band-aid <laughs> no you see uh, you don't get it you see I had to name myself as my own beneficiary well darling yeah let me if, help I, you with... if I die the money goes to me you see oh, <laughs> you just let me help you with that problem yes look I hope you don't think I'm rude but I bought a little engagement ring for us <laughs> for me yes for you darling, oh, darling. there you are Oh, it's beautiful. Isn't it pretty? How do you yeah, like it? I just can't believe it's real. <laughs> it's real, girl. Uh, Go. Uh, yeah. uh, darling, does that mean... <laughs> Will you get that pizza knife out of my... <laughs> uh, darling, does this mean you want me to be your wife? It's quite a weapon you have there, you know. <laughs> Oh, no. I thought of it. Do you, do you want me to be your wife? Yes, let's seal the bargain with a kiss, huh? Oh, one kiss, a thousand kisses. I'm ready, I'm puckered up, baby. I know you're there, I can hear breathing. Don't make a meal out of it, kid, will you? Tell me, baby. Will you marry me? <laughs> if she don't, I will. <laughs> the Ed Sullivan Show. In fact, he even appeared on his own television show in the early 50s called Frankie Lane Time. He was married to a gorgeous movie star, Nan Gray. Bobby Sox was nicknamed the Lanettes were painting the letters of his last name on their fingernails with purple nail polish. They even coined a word to describe Frankie, Hexy. He had a command performance before the Queen of England alongside Bob Hope and performed to huge crowds in England, in Scotland, and in Italy. We were riding high, and then Rock came in. <laughs> and uh, everybody in what I like to call normal music Took a little bit of a beating there for a while. Well, since my baby left me, well, I found a new place to dwell. Well, it's down at the end of Lonely Street. Our brain can't ever love. Our baby's a lonely baby. Our life's a lonely. Our life's a lonely. I could die. Elvis Presley. Buddy Holly, Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry, and Little Richard, they all wanted a seat at the table. Record sales plummeted for the traditional artists as the rock and roll explosion hit, and I mean hit big. It happened that uh, I got lucky at that particular time with Moonlight Gambler. When Mitch Miller first brought Frankie Moonlight Gambler, the singer didn't believe it would be a million seller. But Mitch was convinced, so he made a bet with Frankie. If the record didn't hit a million, Mitch would shave his trademark beard. But if it did, Frankie would have to grow a beard and leave it on for at least six months. Frankie lost the bet. The song went gold, and he grew a beard for the first time in his life. Moonlight Gambler. They call me the Moonlight Gambler. Yeah. I gambled for love and lost. I know it. <laughs> He's call me the Moonlight Gambler. Well, I've gambled for love and lost. It's been said there's only one thing harder than getting to the top, and that's staying there. Frankie Lane, by now nicknamed Mr. Rhythm, was about to face his toughest battle yet. In 1954, Frankie's longtime musical collaborator Carl Fisher died of heart failure at 41 years old. Remember the sun has shone Laugh and the world will laugh with you 
cry and you cry alone. No tears. There's a point there where Frank really gave up. He was devastated because they became soulmates. But um, Carl's wife, Terry, and Nan, they both had two little girls. Frank was raising two girls over here. Carl's were raising him. They were really good friends, very close. Uh, there was such empathy between the two families that after Carl passed away, Terry, uh, Carl Fisher's wife, is the one that helped get Frank back on the road again. It was an extremely special relationship. Uh, and we knew that from our mother as well as from Frank and everyone else that we knew, that we talked to about him. Anybody that knew him had stories, would stop and just go on and on. So it's, it's, been, it was, it's been pretty amazing. I feel that uh, Rawhide was a big, big turning point. And Rawhide really saved my skin, I think, because the kids all loved cowboys and Indians and Western things. Beginning in the mid-1950s, Frankie found himself singing more and more movie title tracks. Something in his voice just sounded Western. In 1955, Frankie recorded the title track for Universal's Man Without a Star and Warner Brothers' Strange Lady in Town. In 1956, he sang the title track for Paramount's Gunfight at the OK Corral and Columbia Pictures' 310 to Yuma. The success of Moonlight Gambler and the Western title tracks led Bill Dozier to approach Frankie with an idea for a television series. He'd been working on this one for a while, and he called it Rawhide. Dozier also went to the songwriting team, Dimitri Tiamkin and Ned Washington, who had written High Noon. It was sung by Tex Ritter on the title track, but a big hit when recorded by Frankie. The three got together and made a song that not only became a number one hit, it helped popularize the television show, starring a young unknown actor named Clint Eastwood. It isn't loaded. Yeah, we've heard that before. He's right, it isn't loaded. But the show couldn't find a sponsor. It seemed no one wanted to support a show with an unknown like Clint Eastwood. Well, I was uh, standing in line at the unemployment office. Actually, I'd had a few years of rather bleak uh, uh, employment, and then uh, Rawhide came along, and, and Rawhide was sort of a a slow start. We did a pilot for it and then it didn't go on and it did go and didn't go. I think probably the reason it went on is because of the song. I think everybody loved the song. Luckily the show did find a sponsor and the song was re-released. And wouldn't you know it, <laughs> yep, it shot right back up where it was, number one with a bullet. Move him out, hit him up, hit him up, move him out, move him out, hit him up, raw hide. Cut him out, ride him in, ride him in, cut him Frankie Lane was going to sing it. So I was very excited about it. I never thought that I'd be in a, in a picture that uh, Frankie Lane would be singing in, much less meeting him later on when, when, when uh, Frankie and his, his lovely wife came on the, the show as, guests, uh, as guest actors. Bye, Carly. Goodbye. So it was a great thrill for me because um, he was a legend for, for me. Around this time, Frankie met the brilliant French composer and arranger, Michel Legrand. 1956, I was invited to a big cocktail party at the Park Sheraton Hotel. The party was being given as a kind of a welcome introduction style to Michel Legrand. And I saw this tall, slim, studious looking guy with rimless glasses, wavy hair, and uh, looked like a, a student, you know. And uh, George Avakian took over because Michelle didn't speak much English, I guess, at that point. So he introduced us. And Michelle looked at me and says, Frankie Lane? I said, see? <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know why. He was working for Columbia Records. And I, I, I was working for Philips Records in Paris. And Philips Records and Columbia were joint, you know, were joined together. So he grabbed me and he hugged me and he did the bit, you know, kissing on both cheeks. And I said, wow, this guy must like our stuff. So then I found later that he was a big fan. At that time I was kind of a, 
had a little name as a crazy arranger orchestrator in Paris. And probably I think he heard of me and he asked me to do an album with him in Paris called Foreign Affairs. And Frankie at that time was a super, super, you know, star in, 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 in Europe because that I've never been to America. I didn't know, but in Europe it was a huge star. You had Jezebel, I mean, all, you know, all, all the film uh, main titles and everything. It was, okay. So I was so proud. He, he was my first American singer to work, to, to work with. Well, I didn't like the sound. The engineer couldn't understand me. And early on, when I knew I was going to have trouble, talking to the engineer and talking to Michelle, I got the idea for him to record the music. And I would dub in later in Hollywood at LA. And that's what we did. What we hadn't figured on is the French didn't care about listening to the Italian songs. The Italians didn't care about listening to the Spanish songs. The Spaniards didn't care about listening to the Portuguese song. And the only song that made any impression at all was Mamzelle. Someday you'll say goodbye. Then violins will cry. And so will I. Mamzelle. album was a bomb, really and truly was a bomb. So then Michelle wanted to come over here to do an album with me. I stayed two or three, three, I think three months at his house. He had a beautiful house in Beverly Hills. So I discovered, you know, California for me. The house of the stars and Frankie and Nan were very, very beautiful people with, with me. And we made a hell of an album called Reunion and Rhythm. And it's, it's, I think it's a fantastic album. I had great great musicians. One night, because he wanted to meet Michelle, Andre Previn showed up, based on our earlier friendship, you know, and uh, came in to meet Michelle, and they were speaking French like crazy, you know, and Michelle asked Andre to sit in. So on four of the songs in that album, uh, we have Andre Previn on piano that nobody made any fuss over at all. It was, I don't even know if he got paid. He helped me to come to America, to discover America, and to start to work. Here. So he was, he was, and he is in my heart, in my memory, a very important person in my life. Recording title tracks for films and recording with the famed Frenchman Michel Legrand not only saved Frankie from the wasteland that many older singers found themselves in as rock grew in popularity. These two moves elevated Frankie to the land of legends. continued to appear on television shows after his performance on Raw High. He was featured on Perry Mason. Radio, 10 o'clock news. Somebody rubbed out friend Charlie Goff. The Danny Thomas Show. All right, let's get it all with real fast. Frankie, this uh, very uh, rambunctious but lovely little creature is the foreign exchange student who lives with us. This is Frankie Lane. Frankie, this is Gina, one of your great fans. Goodbye. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Not so fast with my fans. <laughs> Let's not send them out to where Elvis is liable to get it. Mike Douglas, Diana Shore. He even made American Bandstand with Dick Clark. I graduated from high school at 17 and went immediately to college, started working in radio stations as a sideline, and I can remember, oh, phew. That's my desire. That was in 1953. I played that as a professional disc jockey then. 
So Frankie's career and his hits have uh, lived me through a lot of good years. One of my most vivid bandstand memories of Frankie Lane was on the 30th anniversary of that show. We had a big party and we'd done a salute to all of the teen idols, Frankie Avalon and Bobby Wright, Dell and Elvis and the rest. And I said, ah, but here is one of the originals. And it was uh, Frankie Lane. He came out and sang and knocked the place dead. Let me introduce one of the most exciting singers of our lifetime, Mr. Frankie Lane. <laughs> One thing I never understood about Frankie was his ability to uh, come up with songs that were appropriate for television shows and motion pictures. I mean, it seems like he did every title song there ever was. At the same time, he'd be singing a romantic ballad that would be playing on the radio. He'd do an up-tempo song. I mean, Mule Train would be out there. He is uh, a man of great versatility. It took me two years before I got another deal at Capitol Records, and that didn't gel because just when we were ready to start releasing the stuff that I had recorded, the Beatles hit. <laughs> Capitol Records was consumed with the fire of the British invasion and American groups like the Beach Boys. But Frankie had transcended rock once, and the determined son of a Sicilian immigrant wasn't ready to give up quite yet. He toured Japan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Taipei, Australia, and Canada. In fact, 
In a Vancouver club called The Cave, Louis Armstrong himself joined Frankie on stage. To spend one night with you And I'll I'll rendezvous And reminisce with you That's my Now, another contract was waiting in the wings. Then we went into uh, a deal with ABC Records, and I had heard a song called uh, I'll Take Care of Your Cares, and we made that our first record on ABC Records, and it was a million seller. So we had another thing going. So uh, we spent 66, 67, 68, 69, and part of 70 at ABC Records. And this guy who ran that company was a, like, it was a success, do the same thing, do the same thing. So when I got a hold of, Lord, you gave me a mountain from Marty Robbins. He says, I don't want you to do that song. I says, I'm gonna do this song, I don't care what you say. And of course, it was a million seller. My woman got tired of the hardships, tired of the grief. And the strife So tired Tired of working For nothing Tired of even being My wife She took my My one ray of sunshine She took my My pride and my joy She took my one reason for living She took my small baby boy But this time, Lord, oh Lord, you gave me You gave me a started looking for a deal and that's when we made a deal with Polydor in England and that's when I went to England to do the tour where we made those tapes that were lost and now after 25 years they've been rediscovered and uh, they've been remastered now and ready to be shown. In the early 70s Frankie was spending a lot of time performing in Las Vegas. In 1972, he sang The Cry of the Wild Goose, and it was on the Merv Griffin show, which was taping at the Caesars Palace. When he got back to his hotel room, he found a message waiting. When I got there, he asked me what I wanted to sing. I said, well, what do you want me to sing? So he says, well, I like Wild Goose. He said, I know you got to do Desire, but I, I, I wish you would do Cry of the Wild Goose. Well, I had no way of knowing that there was going to be a guy named Mel Brooks in L.A. watching the Merv Griffin show. But I did Wild Goose the way we always do it, you know, rough and tumble and screaming. And uh, apparently it struck him right because there was a phone call waiting for me at the hotel when I got back saying, please call Mel Brooks. So I called Mel Brooks and I didn't know who he was, you know, who he is. So he says, uh, I'd like for you to do the theme song for my new movie. Saddle 
he wore a shining star. His job. I thought he wanted me to do a serious high noon western kind of, and that's the way I did it. Nobody, nobody told me it was a comedy. What's your name? Well, my name is Jim, but most people call me Jim. But then it all turned out great. It's now become a cult movie, and it, it's incredible. So you never can tell. Sometimes these things happen for the best. Who knows? The retro interest in the 1950s exploded in the 1970s with films like American Graffiti and television shows like Happy Days. Later on, Frankie found his songs featured in movies like Blazing Saddles, The Last Picture Show, and Raging Bull. Frankie Lane has had an enormous impact the world over. I think that Frank probably was one of the forerunners of uh, blues, of um, rock and roll. Um, a lot of um, um, singers who sing with um, um, a passionate um, demeanor, uh, Frank was and is definitely that. I always used to love to mimic him with, that's, you know, my desire. And then later, Johnny Ray came along that made all of the kind of movements, but Frank had already done them. You know? I really do believe, I really do believe there's a heaven somewhere. Music makes the world go round, the way to be happy is how I found. Sing the song, you're happy and free, together our children. But I've heard the music since the day I was born And I ain't afraid of what the good Lord said Cause I hear the music and it's above my head Well, to see him in person was something else. You know, he was just so electric. Uh, you could listen to him and that was sensational. But to watch him in person was the dynamic thing. And he had all those, those moves, you know. If you can impersonate somebody, and everybody impersonated Johnny Ray and Frankie Lane, those were the two, because they had something special. He had a, a different sound, you know, and he had, you know, such emotion and heart. And of course, you, you recognize Frankie, just like, you know, Sinatra had that sound that you'd always recognize. That's what made for hit records as well as being a great singer, but you, you have to have a real uh, special sound that never changes. He could do it all in that, but again, you, you always knew it was Frankie Lane. Papa loves Mambo. Mama loves Mambo. Don't play the rumba. Don't play the samba. Cause we love the Mambo tonight. He was like a family friend. When I first met him, there was nothing of the uh, attitude of a star or a celebrity. Over the years, I've run into Frankie and I see him and he's still that same sweet, wonderful, friendly, lovely person who's never taken himself terribly seriously or played the role of a celebrity or a star. You can't categorize him. He's um, one of those singers that uh, is not in one track. And yet, and still, I think that um, his uh, records had more excitement and, and life into it. And I think that was his big sailing point, that he, he was so full of energy. You know, when you hear his record, it, it, it was dynamite energy. My God, what a voice this man has. You know, incredible voice. And the way he used it and, and abused it at times, I think, you know. Uh, but he was a, a great artist. And he had a range that was incredible. Uh, he, he, he'd sound like Lonzo at times, put Lonzo to shame at times, because he was a wonderful singer. Not only a great voice, but a great singer. I think, I think Frankie was one of the great singers of all time. Everybody made such a big deal over him. I mean, it, it didn't mean anything to me, but uh, he had a horse of his own. And uh, after they got married, they bought a ranch in Encino. So we kept the horse there. And Dad and I were down at the, at the stable one day, and I was doing something I had no business doing. And he told me to stop it. And I turned around and I said, who do you think you are just because you're Frankie Lane? I didn't know what it meant, but everybody else made such a big deal out of it that Mother got a little angry at that. Daddy did not bring his celebrity into his home. 
he, at the door, he took off his toupee, and he was daddy. And, you know, he, he was, he read, and he worked at the piano. Every summer we went to Laguna, and, you know, we were just at the beach, running up and down, all of us with the dog, and that was our life. You know, daddy's other life was just when he went away. We were loud, intense singers, and we believed what we were singing. And we didn't sing, you know, boop, boop, did em, dot em, wad em, chew, or, or I, I got you, babe. We didn't sing those kind of songs. We sang songs that, if they didn't tell a story, they implied a story. And uh, we both had very, intense feelings about music. And disc jockeys, the disc jockeys, always looking for something, a hook to hang everything on, you know. They started calling me the, the female Frankie Lane and him the male K star. And we thought that was very funny. We talked on the phone a couple of times about it. We couldn't, we didn't know why they did it, but we figured it was because we were intense singers. I say he was bigger than life. And he, he was a good guy, and everybody, everybody, uh, it would, he, would, he would invoke a, a smile if you, if you heard him or thought about him, you know. Say, hey, Frank Lane, yeah. I was in like the seventh grade, and it was, that's my desire. And you could not turn on the radio that you didn't hear that song. And all of us were just in love with him then, you know. Never knowing, of course, that I'd be able to work with him and get to know such a lovely man. You know I'm not supposed to socialize with the customers. But honey, Big Dan ain't a customer. He owns the joint. I know. Frankie Lane was somebody that everybody knew. He was a kind of a household word like Frank Sinatra or Bobby Darin or Peggy Lee or Ella Fitzgerald. Frankie Lane was, was one of the great popular singers and stylists of, of that time. So he's a friendly, affable, genuine, unpretentious man who was always appreciative and fun to work with and, and uh, was always rewarding. And his style, you know, we would do this whip-cracking things and these folk songs that he would bring into his style to record. and, and uh, he, he, he was one of those artists that had such a unique stamp. Nobody sounded like he did. You could hear two notes and you knew who it was and you were right on the beam with it right away. And of course, having, that defines a successful popular artist, at least at that time. These people were all very uniquely individual and Frank was, was in, the front, in the front rank of those people in his appeal to the public and his success and certainly in his identifiability. I went to New York and I uh, sang I Believe on the Ted Mack Amateur Hour and won. And uh, I've, there's been a soft spot in my heart for, for I Believe ever since. I've sung it countless times since. And it was because I was a Frankie Lane fan. I will never forget how warm, supportive, encouraging he was to a kid who was sort of trying to follow uh, in a way in his footsteps. I even sang Jezebel. <laughs> you, you can imagine what that must have been like for a high school kid to be singing Jezebel. But, you know, these were hit songs, and Frankie Lane was a hit maker. I think all of the uh, singers of that era were very much different. They all had their own individual style and sound. You knew who Frankie Lane was the moment he came on. Frankie had such a wonderful reputation, and, and he was so popular. We just loved him. And I loved, loved, just loved working with him. He was Howard Hughes' favorite singer also. The fact that he was a little Italian kid from a mixed neighborhood, not necessarily all Italian, there were Irish and you name it, in our neighborhood, uh, can make it if they really want to make it and if they think they have some talent. Of course, you got to have the talent to begin with, and he did. And uh, that should show people that, you know, it can be done if you want to do it. Wonderful thing was, I used to see him on the stage, and I'd say, this has to be a nice man, you know? Because uh, when I got started, I worked for the Italians well, I don't want to say the, the boys, but I worked for those guys. And they had a, there was a wonderful quality they had. 
And Frankie grew up in those kind of neighborhoods, and he had that quality. He left an impression on my life. He asked about my heritage and so forth. So we were talking, and we were on the plane one day, and I said, well, it's a mixture of this and this, and, and I said, uh, also, Yaki Indian. And he said, oh, Carl Fisher was an Indian. That was his first conductor. And now in Frank's later years, when I joined him, he said, well, you, you've got Indian blood in you too. Um, you're gonna be my last conductor. And I thought, gee, that's kind of sad, Frank. You know, he says, no, I'm gonna stay with it. There's something to it. With the way Frank Elaine sings is very expressive. And that's what I've always uh, loved about the way he sings, because that's the way I uh, sing myself. You know, it's developed. Uh, into that because I, um, I like to express myself as much as possible on stage and that's, you know, comes from uh, listening to Frankie Lane. Because that's, that's what he was doing. All, every record I've ever heard Frankie Lane's, you can, you can hear every word. You know, there's no, you know, what did he say? Some, some of the, you know, especially with, when rock and roll kicked in, in, in the 50s, um, we'd have to try and figure out what, what they were saying. You know, in some of the old blues records as well, you'd think, what is that? But with Frankie Lane, you knew every, every word because, you know, it was so definite and so, uh, you know, so dynamic and, uh, and expressive. And that's what I've always uh, loved about the way he sings. Shine, light with your shoes, you say now. Shine it twice up, make it look like new. Why don't you shine your face up, baby? Frankie Lane's story is the story of the American dream. As the son of Sicilian immigrants, born near the beginning of the 20th century, he's faced the Great Depression, war, the attack on his career by two waves of the rock invasion. And in later years, he's had two heart surgeries and the death of his beloved wife, Nan. Now remarried to Marsha Klein, Frankie lives in a beautiful home overlooking the bay in San Diego. Through it all, Frankie Lane not only survived, he triumphed. He is what he always wanted to be, a singer and one of the best. His life reminds us and inspires us to believe that if we dream big enough and work hard enough, we too can achieve the American dream. Yeah, buddy. Rain that falls, a flower grows. I am a singer.
Frankie Lane, a uh, world famous popular singer. This is your life. <laughs> oh,